Hello, I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory, and I'm going to tell you something that might surprise you. Now, you probably knew that clinical trials have inclusion and exclusion criteria, and you have to pass a few screenings before you can make it into a clinical trial. But what you may not have known is that almost everyone is excluded from clinical trials, even when they have the condition that is being studied. And I want to tell you why we do that and why we have to do that. I never see this mentioned uh, publicly, so I thought it would be good to share this information in case you're ever in a situation where you're screened out from participating in a clinical trial and you're, and you're wondering why that happened. Um, now, first, let me tell you the percentage of people who make it through the screening. There's roughly three levels of clinical trials for patients. I'm just going to call them small, medium, and large clinical trials. Small clinical trials are when we do the first test of an experimental treatment in patients, and that may have only 10 patients. And in my lab, only about five out of 100 interested patients actually make it through a study like that, uh, where they're receiving the treatment. Um, now, these are people who contact us, they believe they have the disease, they do the screenings, and only about 5% of those people are accepted, which means, of course, 95% of people who want to participate can't. And that's in a, that's a, in a very small experimental study. Now, in a medium-sized clinical trial with around maybe 100 patients, it's a little better, um, but only about 1 out of 10 people make it into a study like that, so 10%. And in larger clinical trials with at least 300 people, it's even better, but it's still only about three out of 10 people make it through all the screenings to participate, or about 30%. And so what that means is that almost everyone gets a message from the research team that says, we're sorry, um, we can't include you in this study. Now, that's obviously really frustrating for potential participants. They have a disease they want help with. They're willing to give up their time and to, quite frankly, give up their bodies to help science and other people who are suffering from that condition. So why would we turn those people away? Now, on my side, I have to I have to tell you, it's very frustrating on my side as well. I have to review these more medically complex screenings, and I'm looking through each person's comorbid conditions and medications, and I'll look through, and I'm, I'm going through the list, and I'm saying, okay, that one's okay, that one's okay, that one's okay, that med's okay, that comorbid condition is okay, and then I'll hit something and go, ah, we we can't take this person. This is one of the exclusions. And it's really frustrating because I want everyone to make it into the study. Everyone who wants to make it in the study, I want them to be able to do it because, you know, I want people to have a chance to try a new treatment. That's why I'm doing this. And also I have a requirement, uh, an obligation to successfully complete the study by reaching the enrollment target, whatever that is, whether it's 10 or 100 or 300, failure to reach the enrollment, the enrollment target is the number one reason why clinical trials fail. And over 80% of clinical trials fall considerably short of their recruitment goals. And I don't want to ever be the lead investigator of a failed trial. So why are so many people excluded from clinical trials? Now, some of the reasons you probably already guessed for example, safety reasons. You already know that. If someone has a, a liver that's impaired, it could be unsafe to give them a medication that requires metabolism by that organ. Um, so that's pretty obvious. I don't think anyone complains about those type of exclusions. And there's also practical exclusions that everyone understands. If the clinical trial requires weekly visits over 10 months, and you live 500 miles away, that's gonna be difficult or impossible to do. So, so I think people get those two. But those are actually not usually the main reasons. And a caveat to all this, I'm only speaking about my clinical trials. Other research teams might do things a bit differently. Um, but the short story is that for a drug to pass through each of those clinical trial stages, like small, medium, large, and then, and then later even extra large, and make it to the point where people can use it, 
and any person can use it, the treatment has to show statistically significant effects at every stage. And if one of those clinical trials fail to reach statistical significance, the process ends there and the treatment is abandoned. And those statistical significance thresholds are tough to hit, and they're very vulnerable to what we call variability or people reacting in many different ways to the treatment. So you can, so I can have a treatment that has a really powerful beneficial effect for many patients, but it may still not reach statistical significance because there's too much variance in the people I selected for the study. And that's especially true with the smaller clinical trials. And it would be a tragedy to have an effective drug that's abandoned because there was uncontrolled variability. And so we have to avoid that. And we do that by controlling as many sources of variability as possible in the group that we recruit for the study. One example is age. Uh, the treatment might work just fine for children, for example, but they may need a significantly lower dose than people who are 30 or 40. And older adults may also need a lower dose. We don't know. Um, because we're just now testing this new treatment. And so we have to heavily restrict the age range, especially in the earlier stage clinical trials. Another example is whatever medications you're taking. The problem is, is when we have a new treatment, we don't know what drugs the treatment will have negative interactions with. We can only know that when we test the interactions. And small or medium clinical trials are not the place to find that out. And so we have to exclude people from many medications that will probably ultimately be perfectly fine to be taken with the treatment we're testing, but we can't take that chance with small or medium clinical trials because especially with the really small clinical trials, one person having an unexpected negative reaction because there's an unexpected drug interaction uh, with the treatment, that could ruin the whole clinical trial. And so we have to be really strict depending on the size of the trial. So if you're excluded from a clinical trial, it does not mean that you don't have the condition. It doesn't mean that we don't believe you. It, it doesn't even mean that the treatment is unlikely to work for you. It just means that at the current stage of clinical testing we're in, we have to be very restrictive about who is enrolled. And if the treatment passes on to a larger clinical trial in the future, you're more likely to be eligible to participate then because the criteria will be relaxed because it's a larger trial. And that's part of what you do with larger trials is you include more types of people to see if it also works for them. And so that's the message uh, that I wanted to share. I know the criteria are very strict. I know it's disappointing to not be allowed to participate when you're wanting to, um, but this is the best way to get the treatment successfully through all the stages and to get it out to everyone, which is the ultimate goal to make it available to everyone, not just people who are in clinical trials. So I thank everyone who is willing to help clinical science by testing new and experimental potential treatments. Without you participants, the process of developing new treatments stops completely. So I hope that little um, tiny behind the scenes look at a very important element of clinical trials is helpful. And I hope you can come back next week and hear more about the scientific advances in MECFS and fibromyalgia and Gulf War illness and long COVID and similar conditions because there is quite a bit to talk about. So I hope to see you soon.